this is really, it's interesting because um, the fact that um, I gave the very first talk, Superpod talk ever at Superpod 1 in 2011. And at that time, we were like 20 people, 30 people, and sitting in somebody's living room and just hanging out. And, and it's been an incredible journey um, for Superpod. Um, but I also uh, thought that I would use that as the context to give you an update on what we know about cetacean brains since I spoke at 2011. Now, so what we'll do is we'll go through um, some of the major things that we know about the brains of the animals that we want to preserve and protect and uh, create a better life for. So the major questions about cetacean brains um, are, one, how large are they? We've always talked about this, and so I'm just going to review what we know about that. Two, how complex and elaborated are they? So, you know, besides being big, they're not just big lumps of tissue, but they are actually very complex because complexity is the other end of the other side of the coin. It's important to have a big brain because that means you have a lot of tissue to work with and to do cognitive stuff with. But um, depending upon how simple or complex that brain is, that makes a difference. How are they organized? And this is where we get into some really interesting territory when it comes to you know, the differences between human brains and dolphin and whale brains. And finally, the fourth question, how do their brains relate to their cognition and behavior? That's the $6 million question, right? We want to know what is it about orcas, bottomless dolphins, belugas, that makes them so intelligent, so behaviorally complex. Um, and, you know, not surprisingly, I'm not going to have the answer for you. Um, this is, number four is the ongoing question that drives those of us who are studying these animals. Um, but what I'm going to be doing today, which is very exciting, at least to me, is I'm going to be presenting two new findings um, that relate to these questions. And it's really great to uh, be followed by a talk on cetacean hearing, because one of those findings bears directly on that issue. So first, the cetacean evolution story. I mean, this is a story in and of itself that's so interesting, and I don't have time to spend a lot of time on it, but this is the story, okay? This is what we know now. We know, let me see if I can bring this over. We know that cetacean brains weren't always as big as they were. They weren't always as complex as they were. Something happened about 35 million years ago, and this has been confirmed over and over by work by myself, by my colleagues, and others. Uh, some, there was a pivot point about 35 million years ago in the evolution of dolphins and whales where their brains got significantly larger and their bodies got significantly smaller. Now, generally, what I'm talking about are odontocetes. The story for mysticetes is similar, but I'm going to keep that aside now because there was a secondary increase in body size that um, just sort of complicates the picture. So I'm going to be concentrating mainly on odontocetes, but it's very similar for mysticetes. What happened 35 million years ago? Well, first of all, and I don't know if I have a Uh, a formidable predator. 
Um, and they had pretty small or average sized brains. So, you know, their brains weren't anything to write home about, but their teeth were. So these were <laughs> large, formidable predators. And somehow, something happened 35 million years ago, not overnight, but of course, in a pretty quick amount of time in evolutionary terms, that they went from this to this. These guys died out, and they were replaced by early forms of what we know today as modern dolphins and whales. What happened? Well, we know that oceanic temperature changed quite a bit, around 35 million years ago. And with that, there was a turnover in prey availability. And this required adaptations in their social ecology. And they went from being a large, formidable predator with big teeth and small brains to a smaller predator with small teeth and a big brain. It's a completely different way of adapting, of surviving. You can do it one way or you could do it the other way. And most cetaceans um, adapted to this change in their environment by doing it the way it's done on the right. They essentially adapted by becoming socially complex brainiacs. So if you don't have big teeth and a big body anymore, you better count on each other. And we know, we know that it was at this time that the inner ear started changing to reflect the fact that they were starting to process high frequency inf information. And what's that? Echolocation, right? Now, we don't know exactly how they were echolocating then or how sophisticated it was then, but those changes started to come into place. So, as I mentioned, there was a substantial change in the size of the brain, as well as the morphology of the brain around 35 million years ago when these new forms came in. How big? Well, this is a familiar graph uh, from one of our papers, and I'll step out, well, maybe I'll just, I'll do this, um, just to orient you. So we have a number of species on this axis, uh, including our own species, our closest relatives, the great apes, um, and some Odonisi species, common dolphin, rough tooth dolphin, and so forth, orca. On this axis, we have something called encephalization quotient. And for our intents and purposes, all it means is it's a, it's a, a measure of relative brain size. How big is the brain compared to the body? And as you go from one, which is average, out to seven, that gets bigger and bigger. Now we know, we know that now there are several dolphin species swimming around in the oceans who for the past 15 million years have had the second highest encephalization levels, relative brain size, of any creature that's ever evolved, including modern humans. So they've had their big brains a lot longer than we have. And you see that those data with the white-sided dolphin, um, common dolphin, rough-toothed dolphin, and the orca all have encephalization levels uh, within three, you know, 2.6 to 5 meaning their brains are up to five times bigger than you'd expect for an animal of their body size. Our brains are seven times bigger, but they're a close second, and they even exceed our closest relatives, the, the great apes. But of course, size doesn't tell you the whole story. Very importantly, we have to think about just how complex uh, the structure and the organization of the brain is. So now I'm going to tell you a few things, and I'm going to try to make this as sort of digestible as possible, because some of this stuff really relies upon having a real 
good familiarity with neuroscience, but you guys, you can get it. So, let's talk about neocortical elaboration. First of all, what do you need to know? The neocortex is the part that is in yellow. This is a human brain, and it's the side, it's like if you took an ax and split my brain in half and then looked inside in the middle. The neocortex is in yellow here, and that is the newest part of the brain in mammals. And that's the part of the brain where there are a lot of complex intellectual abilities that uh, are processed. Things like self-awareness, things like problem solving, communication, all the stuff that we think about, all, all the things that you're doing right now, processing information that we're all doing when we pretty much are thinking about something, that's happening in the neocortex. So if you have a lot of neocortex, you can do a lot of that stuff. Well, the neocortex is actually a sheet that appears wrinkled on the surface, and but is actually a sheet that if you pulled it out, it would kind of look like this. Um, and it would go on for quite a while, and there's columns in the neocortex. And each one of those columns is like a processing unit. Okay, so now, I'm sure many of you, especially those of you who are in school, have been taught that humans are really smart because we have a lot of gray matter. And what that means is simply that we have a lot of neocortex. And it's so, there's so much of it that we have to pack it into our heads and it gets crinkled up. That's the way you pack a lot of tissue into a small head. And so we're really proud of the fact that we have a really convoluted brain, you know, and it's more convoluted than the chimpanzee. And we're happy about that. <laughs> well, the fact is, is that it is not the most convoluted brain on the planet. The most convoluted brain on the planet is of the adult orca. You can see that here. Not only is the orca brain much bigger than the human brain, but it has more surface area for processing information than any other brain on this planet. So how do I know that? Because I can take the neocortex from this brain and look at it in cross section. Here's all those convolutions. And within those convolutions are columns of processing. So the more surface area you have, the more columns and the more the potential for complex processing but they beat us out on this. So we need to just stop saying that we're the most wrinkled brain and that means we're the most intelligent. I mean, it, it's only related to intelligence. It doesn't mean everything, but if we're gonna say that convolutions are important, then we have to give credit where credit is due and the credit is due to Orcus. To find out just how extraordinary the orca brain is, let me just check on this because, right, okay. Okay, so just to, to find out how extraordinary the orca brain is, a research team recently did a study using magnetic resonance imaging, which is simply a, a way of uh, visualizing slices through the brain without actually slicing it up. You get a brain from an individual who has died and you put it in a scanner, it's a medical scanner, and you get these kinds of images that are generally, they're just basically cross sections through the brain, sometimes a couple of millimeters thick. And you can see here all of the convolutions um, and here's some, here, this, uh, auditory processing area, visual processing. Here's the midline. Here's the famous corpus callosum that connects the two halves of the brain. Here's the cerebellum. 
So you can use magnetic resonance imaging to get a lot of information about the brain, keeping it intact. Now, Pardon me? Yes. Yes, none of this is stuff is done. You don't kill orchids to do this, right? Um, all of it is done post-mortem. And post-mortem from strandings um, or individuals who have passed away in captivity. Um, and when it's done from strandings, you have to get out there real quickly and get the brain out and put in a preservative uh, kept there for many weeks in order to get those data. So, you know, it's a rare thing when you're able to get an intact brain because as soon as an animal dies, the brain starts to deteriorate. Um, what this is, is a table from a very recent study uh, done by um, Sam Ridgway and his team animal who died naturally and what you see here are not a bunch of numbers and I want to call your attention just to the two values that are circled this is in blue a number that represents the portion of the whole brain that the neocortex makes up. So you see the number 62.14 to 76.18. That's a lot. We're, we're primates. Primates are smarty pants. Okay? We've got big neocortex. But it turns out that if you look at orca, that percentage in red is 81.5%. So I'm just going to distill this down for you because it is really incredible. The authors call it profound corticalization. Here's the bottom line. Orcas have evolved proportionately more of the complex thinking part of the brain than humans have. magnetic resonance imaging scan of the orca brain from one of our studies. And here is, uh, and what I want to show you is what I talked about in Blackfish, the famous paralympic globe. Okay? It's a cross section through the brain. And um, maybe I can use the pointer. Um, there's just a couple things you need to know. Oh, here it is. Okay. <laughs> There's something called the limbic system, which is a very evolutionarily conserved old part of the brain. Everybody's got one, all vertebrates. And it involves processing memory and emotions. And this part of the orca brain that you see here, um, the limbic system, part of it is represented by this limbic lobe, this area here that has a lot of convolutions. However, if this were a human brain, another primate brain, um, there would be something that, well, let me put it the other way around. Because this is a cetacean brain, there's something there that wouldn't be there if there was a human brain. And that's the paralimbic lobe, meaning uh, an extra lobe of tissue that interacts very closely with the limbic system. It has extremely dense connections with the limbic system. So when you look at this brain, you see a limbic system and then this whole other lobe that evolved to do something with the limbic system. Using inference, we don't know for sure, using inference, we can say that this is a brain doing something very complex with emotional processing because of the fact that it has Orcas and other dolphins and whales have a part of the brain that we really don't have. So that's another score one for the orcas. <laughs> um, 
Human sensations differ in terms of which parts of their neocortex receive visual and auditory information. Now, here we're going to get into the new auditory finding, which I'm so excited about. On the left is a human brain, on the right is a dolphin brain. In the human brain, as you know, we process information from our ears, goes up and ends up there in the temporal lobe, the side of the brain. Visual information ends up in the back of the brain, in the occipital lobe. That's how everybody does it, except the dolphins and whales. They've evolved a very different organization. In fact, their auditory visual systems, or the, the part of the brain that receives auditory visual information, is really not in those places at all. It's actually, it's actually up here. Here's the visual, and the auditory is right next to each other. Oh, pointer! Woohoo! <laughs> So, visual, auditory. In the dolphin, visual, auditory, in the human, and everyone else. So it's, it's a different plan. Information comes in differently. It goes to a different part of the brain than the human. And you know, this kind of makes sense, right? Because you see the visual and auditory are right next to each other. And the story we tell ourselves in our heads is that that's really important for echolocation because we know from studies that they go back and forth between visual and auditory information very rapidly. So that, that, that information needs to be really close together in the brain. And in fact, there it is. And this is the situation um, that we thought was um, the situation for decades now. But wait. There's more to the story. <laughs> Last year, my colleagues and I published a paper in which we showed that we, there are actually more than one auditory system <laughs> in the dolphin brain. Now, how do we do that? Very quickly. This is a kind of magnetic resonance imaging scan. But what it is is a way to specialize and image major fiber systems. What you see here is a dolphin brain side view. Here's the front, here's the back. And everything that you, all the threads here, obviously except this is artifact, all the threads here you see um, here's the center, here's the uh, brain stem. Those are major fiber systems in the dolphin brain. And through this special magnetic resonance imaging technique, we can visualize them. The different colors represent different directions that they're going in. Okay? So just take that in for a moment and the level of complexity there. And without this technique, we wouldn't have found what we found. But these are all the major connections in the dolphin brain. So when we did that, we traced the auditory tract from the ear up to the neocortex. We wanted to be sure of the traditional view of where auditory information lands in their brain. So we actually looked at the fiber tracks, the major fiber track going from the ear up to the brain. We know it's auditory because we followed it all the way from the ear, the inner ear. And our results were really shocking. We found that dolphins have two auditory tracks from the inner ear to the brain, not one. We, there's one that goes up to the top of the brain that I showed you before, and one that goes to the side of the brain, like humans and other animals. So just to distill this down, this is the human brain, and this is the track that goes from our inner ear 
to our temporal lobe, the auditory primary cortex. This is what I showed you before. The, this track goes up to the top of the brain and sits in a very different region. That auditory region is right next to the visual region, and that goes to something called the parietal lobe, and that's the one we said, yeah, it makes sense, they do at the location. But this is what we found in addition to this, that this also, and if you look here and here, you can see it looks more like this than this, that they have an ascending primary auditory tract to the temporal lobe as well. So dolphins have two primary <laughs> auditory systems. Um, what does it mean? We don't know yet. We think. We're just hypothesizing that this system is involved in echolocation and this system is involved in the processing of other kinds of sounds. But I think anyone who studies the effects of acoustic noise on dolphins should be interested in knowing that they're dealing with a very complex system. Some of that system looks like this and another system that looks like this and is more similar to our brain and other animal brains than this. So this we discovered a whole new system in the brain. So that adds to our complexity of what we really understand about these animals. So what do we know? We know cetaceans evolved to have large complex brains and it began around 35 million years ago they have the second largest encephalization level and some parts of their brain are even more elaborated than the human brain. The way they became elaborated is different from the way primate brains did so. But just as we thought we knew the whole story, it may be that cetacean brains have some connectivity features with primate and other brains that they share because we now know that they have two auditory systems. Um, and cetacean brains are really a unique combination of features and the story becomes more complex the more we learn about them. And so I'm just going to leave you with a question. What kind of mind does a brain like this produce? Thank you. imaging, which is the, the connections. Functional MRI, um, you, you need a, a living, aware being in the skin. Yeah? And what caused the artifacts you were pointing out? Oh my gosh, those artifacts have to do with just the, the, um, the kinds of protocols that you use to um, visualize the brain. Um, they have nothing to do with, you know, the brain itself, it's just how you set up the scanner. And, you know, since we were doing this for the first time, it's not perfected yet to, to look at everything in that way. They're magnetic effects, essentially. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, thank you. Is there a central focus in the... In yes. The Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, 
when we talk about, you know, so you're right. So the visual and auditory primary cortex, neocortex, is up here. What we call the parietal lobe, but that's not where we do vision and audition. That's where we do other things. Um, so the whole map of their neocortex is different. It means that the information that comes in and goes out is organized according to a different map than the human brain. Um, they have an orbital lobe, uh, an occipital lobe, if you want to call it that. I mean, it's, it's the kind of thing where, yeah, it's in the back of their brain, like ours, but evolutionarily it has a different story. Um, and the, the whole brain changed once it got bigger and um, it just got a very different morphology and that morphology affected just where things are in the brain. Does that answer your question? Oh, uh, please, tell me, <laughs> tell me. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm more familiar with terrestrial mammals, and so I'm trying to figure out, you know, or somatosensory and motor. Somatosensory and motor are, are where, those are the two that are kind of where you expect them to be. Um, but forward of the parietal lobe, a little forward, they were pushed forward. Okay, posterior, we have no idea. <laughs> and we don't have any idea about the temporal lobes except for this one auditory region that we found. Both of these are published studies and I'd be happy to provide them. As I said, the last study I talked about was our study um, and the, the other study about the corticalization was done by Sam Ridgeway's team, but both of them I can make available, at least you can have the citation, of course. Yeah. Hi, Lori. Um, I'm just curious, um, as a writer, I know you're a scientist, if you could give us your best guess, if we're a room full of dolphins, how would we be communicating with you about this talk right now? What would be our experience? <laughs> Is time up yet? <laughs> I feel like Ralph Cramden. I'm dating myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, how would, you know, I, I honestly, obviously we would be in the water and communicating. I think, I think we would be communicating about it, I don't know, content-wise, like what we would say as dolphins to some human who got up there and said, well, this is what we know about the dolphin brain. But <laughs> it, the communication would be very rapid. I mean, the things that we know about dolphin brains, they process acoustic information at a pace that is completely off the charts. So they can process a lot of information. And so they probably, I mean, I, I think that when dolphins and orcas interact with us, they have to slow down because they know we're just limited and <laughs> plotting. And, and we may appear very plotting to them. And anyone who's worked with dolphins knows that they can get really impatient and they're like, what do you want, what do you want? And so I think that there would be sort of this, uh, I, I don't know, kind of very rapid transmission of information across individuals, which you see. Thank you. When you're um, looking at some of the stuff that we've learned about the, the dolphin brains in terms of being more complex and the, what you just said about the higher percentage devoted to the neocortex, mm -hmm. do you think evolutionarily we're looking at a more advanced brain than a human brain or just a different track? Well, I try not to use the term advanced because that has a lot of baggage with it um, because in fact every, every species on the planet now is advanced in their own way, but I, I know what you mean. Um, and I don't, you know, I try not to say 
which is more intelligent, which is more advanced. What I'd like to do is just let the data speak for itself and the data telling us that this is a brain that's set up to do some really complex stuff whether that's more or less than humans, whether it's more in orca versus beluga. Um, I'm trying to get away from ranking a little bit, you know, and just try to say, these are the characteristics of this brain. Given that, what is that mind like? If we want to call it, I can, I can clearly say that there are parts of the orca brain and other dolphin and whale brains that are more complex than, and more elaborated than in humans. Absolutely. I'm curious about, um, in terms of functional brain mapping, how you said they have the visual um, and auditory on top of their brain. Has that been compared at all? I don't know anything about this, but has mm -hmm. that been compared at all to any other species that do echolocation? Like, would they have that on the top as well? Is that just a function of echolocation? Yes. So the, the, the audit, that's an excellent question. Bats, there are similarities in the bat brain and in the cetacean brain. Um, but the cetacean brain is, I call it, you know, I mean, it's, they've taken it to another level, right. you know. But there definitely are similarities because if you have to echolocate, there's just some ways of doing it that are better. So I was going to ask, you talked about how hearing is enhanced in cetaceans. So a lot of times things are compensated for that. So like humans, we have more advanced eyesight, but we lost our sense of smell. Is there anything that was lost in cetaceans? Or oh. Is there addition because of their enhanced hearing? Well, yeah, they lost smell. Okay. And much of taste, not all of it, but much of taste. So their olfactory system, this hearing system, completely disappeared. And in mysticetes and in baby or fetal dolphins, you still see a little olfactory lobes um, in very young ones that recede over time, over a few weeks after birth. So yeah, can only get, get so much in that, room, in that head. Um, we talked about the limbic system, which is responsible for empathy and emotional intelligence. And then you show the paralympic system, which says they're doing something with all of this empathic information. Is it possible to speculate that that explains why, when there's a capture and the matriarch is tethered, that the extended family simply does not leave? Because a lot of people question why don't, during Heidi captures or captures, why don't they run? Um, and would we put out there that, that it's very likely possible that their advanced empathic system simply won't abandon their family that's captured? And if that's the case, does it really call for a questioning of the absolute immorality of our taking advantage of that fact mm -hmm. when we do drive captures? Thank you for that, and I think you are dead on. Um, we do take advantage of the fact that they are, that what they're about is each other, right? And they won't abandon each other. And that paralimbic system, I didn't talk about, but it, it is involved. I mean, if you really look at what's there, the structures, and the structures in the human brain that are in a similar place, you see that this is, has to do with processing emotion, social cognition, and it also creates a bridge between their limbic system and other parts of the brain, the neocortex, um, that tells me that there's a processing of emotion and high-level stuff going on back and forth. So I think I mean, that's the best inference we have. Um, I think it's generally right. Yeah, I think we're completely taking advantage of the fact that, you know, their brains are wired differently than ours. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to just a couple of questions for Dr. Marino. And Lori, you're going to be here for the rest of the day and tonight, tomorrow. and, and Lori has been at the whale sanctuary table and 
Um, so I'm sure you'll be available to answer any questions. I mean, as always. And and before Lori leaves the stage, I just wanted to say thank you so much for organizing the Scholar Advocacy Roundtable in the day. And, and it, was a, it was a really great day. And I think really, really enjoyed it. We, know, we know how busy Dr. Marino is, so the fact that she was able to take the time and get on some conference calls with us and organize that day, it was great. So thanks a lot for that. Appreciate it.